You did something that I highly recommend students do who can do it specifically for AMCAS. Mission accepted, season three. How are you doing, my friend? Not bad. How are you? I am doing well. I'm doing better than you because I'm not in medical school anymore. <laughs> I'm done with that craziness, uh, but you are in the thick of it. So uh, you are better than I at this time. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming on and sharing a little bit of your story. Um, we, we were just chatting before I hit record. You received your acceptance to your top choice school six days before orientation started. Six days. Never say never. Where were you in kind of your, uh, what's what's the, the phase of like grief is denial and then anger and then like, where were you in the stage of like, darn it, I have to reapply. I was comfortable because I was working really hard at making like a life that I enjoyed outside of school so that, you know, I had the apartment that I liked. I had a job that I liked. You know, I had a group of friends that I really liked. So it was, it was okay because I worked really hard to build that for myself. So not everything was weighing on the A. Um, and I was going to take that next year off um, and retake the MCAT. So it wasn't like I was like ready to spend all the money again <laughs> right yeah. away. So yeah, and it just it just worked out. So yeah. I can't complain. Let, let's talk about why you think it worked out. So uh, there, there are lots of variables in the medical school application process. Was this your first application cycle? Yep, first okay. cycle. So first cycle, top choice school that you ended up getting into. Why do you think you were successful getting into that school, even if it was last minute? Because you got in. <laughs> I think um, I spent a lot of time I know knowing the school, knowing what their values were, knowing um, how I fit in with those values. And um, I spent a lot of time knowing not just stuff about the school that you would get from like the, an internet searcher from their homepage. Um, I attended a lot of seminars that they had just for the community um, for years and years. And um, I did research for the school. So I definitely spent a lot of time knowing more about them than just your average applicant. Mm -hmm. And I could say verbatim, like why I felt like I was a good fit. Um, I also worked with, um, throughout my clinical experience, I worked with a lot of their graduates. And so I was able to say in my interview, I want to go to your school because I want to be like the graduates that I worked with. Yeah. And I think that that was more effective than just saying, you know, oh, I know you're a good fit for me just yeah. because, you know. Yeah. And that that definitely helps. Where in the process did you get an interview with this school? Um, so actually, I so this is a school that does holds. So I got a hold in October. Okay for an interview. Okay. So in October, I got the hold, I got pulled from the hold for an interview list in December. Okay. And I interviewed in January. Um, and when I interviewed in January, um, I got on the wait list. Okay. And do you know if then, you were interviewing for a wait list spot at that point? Or did they mm -mm. did they tell you? Nope. But yep, then I was on the wait list. And I called a few times. And I just said, you know, as the process went on, how's it going? You know, just wanted to make sure that you have everything. Um, and they went from there's 100 people on the wait list to there's 30 people, there's 20 people, there's six people. And then they <laughs> called me. <laughs> and then they called you. And then they called me. Yeah. It, was there anything else that you did in that process besides just checking in with them? Did you give them updated grades if you were doing them, updated activities? Did they want anything at all? Um, I sent in a few more letters of recommendation that I had prepared from ahead of time. Okay. Um, but they only let you send in like three or whatever on the MCAS per mm -hmm. section. And then, um, but once you got put on the wait list, they let you send in as many letters of recommendations and update letters that you want. So <laughs> I sent in more letters and then I um, also submitted um, a couple letters of interest as well, kind of further talking about like what I've done in addition to what is on my application um, nice. that would make me a good fit for the school. Okay. All right. Well, let's take a look at your application and, and see what went right and maybe areas of improvement if, if possible. So uh, let's take a look now. Um, so the first thing I love to look at is when did you submit and you submitted in May, May 30th. So right at the beginning of the application cycle, got it in nice and early. How stressful was it for you to get it in that soon? I was ready. Yeah, you're ready. Yeah. Why were you ready? Um, I started prepping for it in 
like December of the previous year. Wow. Um, got some essays written. Got I did all my letters of recommendation on Interfolio, so those are already in and ready to go by January. Yeah, I'm excited. We're we're at Mapped creating uh, a Interfolio like a letter recommendation service. So oh, awesome! All right into Mapped soon. We're we're actually definitely... building it out now. Yeah, I would definitely recommend that if you can get um, those letters banked somewhere, yeah. because then it's like the pressure's off and you don't have to be calling people. Where's my letter? That doesn't <laughs> feel good. <laughs> yes, you don't need that stress in your life. That is definitely uh, true. All right, so uh, keep looking here. Demographics mostly uh, redacted out, not marked as disadvantaged, not marked as SES disadvantaged. And no red flags coming in here, no military service. And then we get to college. We get to grades. And we see right off the bat, we got a C plus in biology. Did you start off this process pre-med? Uh, I started out not sure if I wanted to do research, if I wanted to do um, something clinical. Okay. Uh, what happened here? C plus in gen bio. Um it was just, I probably just the struggle of, you know, tra of taking care of yourself and being a freshman and, yeah. you know, that whole process. Yeah. It was a lot. It's a, it's a wrong name for getting a C plus as a pre-med. Like, that's no hope. That's no hope there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that's not true uh, because you obviously have, have uh, fixed these issues and have proven yourself, which is what we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. So just looking at grades, right? Some, some early struggles. So rough transition for you going through this process, uh, getting some withdrawals and uh, orgo. Welcome welcome to the OCHEM club. Uh, and then we start to see some other funky stuff that these transfer credits looks like. Uh, Those are AP, some AP yeah. credits coming in. Uh, and then you get some more A's and mostly B's coming through. We're into our senior year now. Oh, that hurts. That stings. It hurt. That one stings a lot, especially with an F. Yeah, especially later on in in your uh, academic career. Um, you retook it and still uh, still struggled a little bit. That's okay. Biochemistry will do that to people. It's one of those things. I think biochemistry is is such a visual um, uh, field that. If if just it just doesn't click with some people's brains, just with how it's presented and how you have to think through things, and some people yeah. struggle with biochemistry. And shocker, you can still be an amazing physician. Yeah, I definitely um, during this the term that I had the F in biochem, I had some kind of pretty emotional stuff happening in my personal life. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely one of those things where um, you know before maybe you'd be able, I might have been able to struggle and get like a C. Yeah, and once you get into biochem. And like those upper level science classes, yeah. when you struggle, there's no, it's, it's not the C, struggling is with something lower than yeah. that. No, so. no room to struggle in those classes, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So how much did your academic, earlier academic kind of resume come into play during your interview, if at all? None. Yeah, I had three interviews and no one asked me okay. anything. Yeah, shocker. <laughs> Everyone's, <laughs> everyone is so worried about... Uh, about those poor grades and how am I ever going to talk about it? Well, if they bring it up, then you just talk about it and you talk about what happened. All right, so let's let's break this down as uh, the AMCAS application PDF here does nicely. And we see here um, 258-322-331. Look at that upward trend going. And then that, those, uh, that F really killed um, any sort of trend going up. And so you really struggled here uh, in your undergrad but then you have this post back GPA that probably saved you in the end. Talk about, uh, we, we often talk about 45 credits, 40 credits. I've always said kind of historically 25 credits. Dr. Scott Wright, former director of admissions at UT Southwestern, he used to run all of TMDSAS, likes to see uh, a little bit longer of, of a trail of about 45 credits. You you did some legwork on figuring out how many credits you should do, so you didn't waste money taking classes maybe you didn't need to. Talk about how you got to 21 credits here. So I live um, in the state of Michigan, and Michigan has a lot of medical schools. So I already had a nice pool that I could reach out to and say, how many credits do you guys view as a new GPA for post-bac? Um, and for everybody that I talked to in Michigan, it was between 20 and 25. Um, and so I specifically asked them, you know, would you accept 21? And most of them, all, everyone but one said yes. So okay. um, 
and that I think ended up working out because I'm here. So yeah. yeah. And what did the one that said no? What did they say? Um, they needed at least twenty five, I believe. Okay. So I would have had to take um like one more class. Yeah. But it was not a school that my my um MCAT would have gotten me into anyway. So I just didn't apply there. How do you know that? Um, just because of just some other of my, the folks that I know who went there okay. um, and um, just kind of word of mouth. So okay. I kind of went with what they recommended, which was a 25 um, for post back because they told me when I called them okay. that that's what they preferred. So you're below this dreaded 3.0 line for your credits. Did you look at maybe just taking the one or two extra classes to get to a 3.0 or was that you were just more worried about the, the 21 number? Um, Once I called around and I said, and I found out that they prefer, like they would accept um, a new GPA at 20 credits of post-bac work. uh, And they said, you know, we will exchange your undergrad GPA with um, the post-bac. Then I knew I was going to be okay. But if I had struggled from this application cycle and didn't get anything, um, I would have taken something else yeah, just to kind of smooth it over. Awesome. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? And and it's it's so variable depending on the schools that you're applying to. What are they going to do with post back numbers? Are they going to completely ignore all of these numbers and just go, great, 388, right? And it sounds like that's what they did in your situation, uh, which is wonderful. And you just, you never know. And I, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish schools were more transparent with exactly what yeah. they're going to do. And I think I had better luck too is because I asked before I applied. I didn't apply and then say, hey, are you going to take, you know, this? I did my homework beforehand um, and I, you know, applied accordingly rather than have spent the money. And then you're like, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's that's perfect. And I I often talk about the different rules of engagement as an applicant versus pre-applicant. So overall GPA was above a three. Uh, Your non-science GPA was strong. So... Great job, all there. And then we get to your MCAT score, and we struggled there as well. What what went ha- what happened there? So I took it once, um, and I took it during COVID, the five hour exam. Yep. Just kind of, I said I was going to do it because um, I knew that I struggled in my my undergrad. So mm-hmm. I said to myself, you know, if I put in the time, like, and actually study, and I don't get above a five hundred, then like maybe I should think about, you know what the pass or what this path will be for me. Mm. Um, but I felt like I put in what I could because I was working as well at the time mm. and then, you know, got over my 500 goal. And so I was like, you know, that might not seem like perfect to everybody else in the pre-med community, but for myself and having known that I had struggled in my undergrad, that was what I was hoping for. So I was like, you know, if I can get to that 500 and be like, at least in the pack, you know, because I mean, considering my, um, my undergraduate GPA, I was like, you know, are we going to be able to do it, you know, with the background that I had? So I was really happy to get over my like personal goal. Um, And I felt like I had a pretty even distribution too in my score. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was pretty happy with it. Um, If I had, my plan was if I didn't get in um, that I would retake it because I felt like, you know, I could, I did it once I can do it again. Um, and again, I only took it one time. The that score you'd mentioned the the one school that said they wouldn't accept twenty one credits for post bac. Uh, you said you knew you wouldn't be able to get in there anyway with your MCAT score. What gave you the confidence that you would get into the school that you got in? The other schools that you applied to with a five hundred one. I kind of had gone with what I watched a lot of your videos. I listened to a lot of your podcasts, and I felt like I had some of the stuff that you talked about, like the connection with the school and everything um, to put me in that category that would be, you know, a different kind of applicant other than just an academic applicant. Um, and so I kind of, you know, threw caution to the wind, I guessed, and, <laughs> and went with it. Yeah. It's just time and money. Just go for mm-hmm. it. Uh, okay. Got it. So uh, 501. So So stats were not necessarily on your side. They were okay. Not horrible, but okay. And you had the the upward trend from post back work, which really, really helps. All right, let's look at your activities. So we get into clinical research coordinator. Uh, you were doing that, uh, looks like full-time job before the application cycle and then through the application cycle, talking about the, the experience that you had here and uh, working with who you're working with and... Um, 
offering hope to individuals has been rewarding. And then you get into a little bit of a story with one of the patients, uh, which is great. And then some reflection there, which is wonderful. So good job with your description there. Uh, Some good clinical experience. Let's jump to the next clinical experience here. Um, So again, this was something you were doing through the application cycle, not as much obviously as your full-time job. This was community service. And you talk about just the, the need, the people in need. And so there's this, um, this health center and who, who it's serving and volunteering and being able to get their regular stuff. And you're talking about newly uninsured patients and offering them resources. So potentially an opportunity here to tell a story of, of one of those people like you did earlier with, with Tina up here but uh, showing the impact that you're making and uh, why it's important to you here at the end is, is good. Uh, let's jump up here, the non-medical clinical, again, something you were doing through the application service, Flint Public Health Youth Academy mentor. And so uh, talking about specifically who you're helping here, uh, encouraging conversations about health, race, zip code, your mentor, Shy, angry people find a voice, decide to pursue avenues to affect health, public policy. Should there be public health policy? Health, public policy? Health? Anyway, uh, (laughs) you have learned a lot about uh, culture, history, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Been able to respond with more empathy and understanding. So a little sales pitchy there. Um, Encourage the awareness of content, uh, current public health issues. So not bad. Again, could have potentially talked about some of the people you've impacted more anecdotally there. Uh, through some stories. So you have some research, which is good. Um, And talking about uh, diabetes, obviously, is huge uh, with retina issues. And the uh, prominence of diabetes, diabetic retinal illness throughout your years of clinical experience. Um, So you're working with retinal cells and uh, looking at the, the impact that that's had. So good job. Again, you don't have to go into, I know how to use R, and I know how to use this one specific science thingy. Uh, that's, that's not the important uh, thing to do here. Um, more clinical experience. So your personal care assistant. And uh, so private uh, client with dwarfism. And so this is interesting. So complicated, a complication related to spine surgery. Uh, lost control of bladder, has to be catheterized, um, prominent member of the community, well-known throughout the state. And so you're just hanging out, being a, a care assistant. How did you get hooked up with that job? Pretty sure I found it on like a care website. Really? Um, mm-hmm. That's yeah, cool. Yeah. And yeah, it was definitely one of those situations where you, I think as a pre-med and as like someone going into medicine, you think that you have to have this like authoritative, like I come with ideas type person um, or personality. And this, this person that I was working for, she, I mean, was in her, her sixties. So she's been doing this forever. And she, you know, would come in and be like, this is what I like. This is what I need. This is what I need you to do. And like how effective, like, you know, listening to your, to who your patient um, yeah. is, especially for those people who have, you know, chronic situations they have to deal with all the time. Your application is different than what I typically recommend. You have, you have a little bit of the sales pitch stuff in here just goes to show you, right? There's, there's not one way to do this that works. And at the end of the day, you have to do what you're comfortable with, what you want to do and, and how you want to present yourself. So uh, I, I like showing some variety there. Some more research here. And uh, obviously exposed to healthcare at a younger age with your mom, uh, looks like being a speech therapist and, uh, seeing all of that and how you wanted to, to get involved as well. So lots of clinical experience, lots of research. Um, we'll, we'll see. Oh, we got hobbies down here. Good. Rescuing parrots. I love it. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so before your, your big jobs now, you were an uh, inpatient phlebotomist. Why did you change from a phlebotomist to clinical research coordinator and uh, other stuff? For the pay. Okay. Because I'm a non-trad. Okay. Yeah, so I have to, I have to eat and I have to live. So. <laughs> That's overrated. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah, phlebotomist is a great um, job during college, but not if you want to like have an apartment and a life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and not live in, in your parents' house. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. All right. So working in the ED beforehand and wanted to, to see what else is going on. And then you you wanted to, to do some more here. So big gym, <laughs> large, jolly pillow of a man. So I read that. I'm like, is that bad? Like, is that negative uh, fat shaming? I don't know. It, it was an interesting. When I first read this, uh, when we were looking at your application, I was like, uh, I don't know. Where, where's the line there? What, what were your, what was your thoughts with writing that? I just think I just saw like a, like a big softy. Yeah. That's kind of how I saw it. Okay. In my mind's eye. Yeah. Okay. Uh, obviously the school that accepted you, accepted you. They didn't, they didn't think you're fat shaming anyone. I don't think you're fat shaming anyone. It's just, it's, it's so like, it's such a complicated line these days. Everyone is like, <laughs> so every, everyone gets angry at everything these days. Um, <laughs> So you're you're hanging out, spending many days talking about food, of course, talking about food because he's a large jolly pillow of a man. Um, <laughs> steak, potatoes, fried chicken. Yum, I'm hungry now. Uh, and then going into his room, uh, <laughs> all this stuff. So y- you're you're talking about what's going on here, just learning to to understand him, understand your patient. And so you're you're showing who you are here, which is why I love the stories because all of this stuff comes out. Uh, through the stories and uh, I just love it so you um, are talking here about why medicine again a little bit of a different angle than I typically recommend I don't I don't think you need to in the activity section talk about why medicine because that's what the personal statements for so uh, but but good good little story there showing who you are hobbies rescuing parrots obviously something you did a lot of why do parrots need rescuing? Um, they're actually one of the most rehomed pets in the United States. Um, and that's because they live so long. Um, they're messy. They're noisy. Um, and so like dogs and cats um, get a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, but birds don't really get as much attention. Um, and they have a tendency like your average bird that lives to be about 30 will have at least like three to five homes in their lifetime. Wow. So, So wow. I kind of just found, fell into it. And, you know, I just really enjoyed it. I saw a need and... Yeah, started helping out. Can can I thought I I saw once that like these parrots that some people have can live like to seventy. Is that true? Oh yeah, they had, some of them can yeah. live to be like eighty plus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I have a friend with a parrot. I'm like, okay, that's a commitment right there. <laughs> it um, is. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting, and it makes sense, right? You, you mm-hmm. a lot of pets are very uh, uh, transient. <laughs> mm-hmm. They come and go. And yeah, and if a dog lives only to be like a maximum of what, like fifteen, yeah. you know, compared to a bird that lives to be eighty, like yeah. that's a lot of houses. So. Yeah, well, that's poor parrots. All right, I'm I sorry. know. Uh, and so you're you're hanging out with a, a cockatiel at, in college, and you wanted a bird of your own. Do you have a bird of your own now? Hanging out of at med, in med school. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. She's um, my biggest fan. <laughs> Does she talk? Does she have any words? Yes. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. MCATs are probably her favorite word, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> 528. 528. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Uh, all right. So uh, love bird named Nemo. So you're you're connecting with uh, the interviewer or the reviewer here. You've rescu- you rescued and rehabbed eight parrots and continue as long as you can, which is awesome. So that's great. So paid employment, more paid employment here, more medical clinical here. So you've done a ton of medical clinical stuff. Um, and you have some community service, not medical clinical as well, less hours here. So again, more phlebotomy, another patient story, which is great. Uh, and then again, kind of the takeaway of like, one day I want to do more. And that's kind of why I like not focusing on why medicine and the activities? Because it always is the same. Like, I want to do more. I want to do more. I want to do more. Uh, versus like just focusing on the specific activity itself that you can reflect on and, and talk about why it was so impactful for you. Um, but good good story there. Uh, talking about good old, good old Larry. So uh, women's self-defense teaching assistant. So it's a, a great opportunity to, uh, to teach some skills there. Um, 
looking at stuff like this, I, I'll look at that and I'll go, okay, it's only for three months. It's 128 hours. Was it really impactful? Why put it on the application? What was the thought process for something like this that's only a few months long? A lot of the schools that I was interested in as far as um, being able to align with my personal goals are very service-based um, service-based schools, very focused on the community. Um, and so I think pointing out in as many places as I can, things that I do that are not like, you know, for the elite that I'm spending time, you know, with um, like either underserved populations or, you know, um, as I talk about in my um, in my personal statement later, like the underdog situation, um, I definitely think that that it was important for me to make sure that I had that throughout my whole app. Um, and even though this is, you know, not as much time as other things that I've done, um, I think it's important to show like the lots of different aspects that I have put time in um, towards that goal. All right. So um, just impacting there. Uh, and this is what I love, right? This is a, a nice reflection to talk about why it was important to you, not needing to tie it together to medicine in any way. So it's great. Uh, physician shadowing, good to have, obviously over a long period of time and a crap ton of hours. How do you get so many hours shadowing? So um, my advice to anybody who's trying to get um, clinical hours is get a job in the hospital um, and use stay an hour early or come in an hour early, stay an hour late, come in, do your lunch breaks with the physician yep. and your hours can really, really add up. So yep. um, just spending like trying to kind of squeeze yourself in wherever there's room um, and keep track. Yeah, definitely great advice. And I, I echo that uh, immensely. So uh, and, and that's what you write. Every spare moment, including breaks and lunches, to shadow as many physicians as you could. So that's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and it's it's easy once um, the physicians see you around and they recognize you. You can be like, oh, can I just follow you into this room? You know, um, and you can really like you don't need to go through all the official channels or whatever. All you have to do is be in somebody's back pocket. You know. Yeah. Follow them around. Yeah. So this is interesting. I don't know if I've ever seen this on an application for a comprehensive list. Please contact me. Did someone recommend you do that or that? I mean, that's um, very much a resume type thing. Yeah, I had um, I knew that I had a lot of hours yeah. and I didn't want anybody to feel like I was hiding something or making something up. So I created like an actual like contact list with every like like when I kept track of it in a um, Excel spreadsheet, I kept track of all the hours, all the people that I watched, you know, everything like that. So, but I didn't want anybody to feel like just because I knew I was coming in with so many hours, I wanted it to be like as straight up as possible. And we know we don't have the space. So I wanted to make sure that if someone had a question, I could whip that out and be like, see, <laughs> <laughs> here it is. Here it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Stop using Excel spreadsheets. Use MapTap for free. <laughs> Track all of those activities for free. Exactly. <laughs> uh, more medical clinical. So so you've been in this medical clinical game for many, many years. Many, many years. Many, many hours. How much do you think that impacted your application? Tons. Tons. I, I just feel like how you say, you know, keep some of your, you know, clinical or your uh, connection to medicine, keep it in your personal statement. But you just get to the point where you have so much of it. It's just like bursting out of your all of all the seams. Like you're just like, I have so many things I want to share and so many experiences I want to talk about. And, yeah. you know, I have so many examples of situations that I've been in that it's like, you can't hold it in. And I think that that really comes across when you um, have that passion and you have that um, commitment and that drive. Mm. Like, and I think that really stood out more than my stats um, because I really, you know, I, I think it's easy to convince people that this is what you're meant to do if you spend years and years and years, you yeah. know, yeah. trying to be as close to it as possible. Awesome. So uh, here you're scribing. So you went from scribe to phlebotomy to clinical research coordinator and other stuff later on. Um, and uh, again, focusing on the impact it's had on you uh, first step into the hospital so you, you're kind of, that was your first kind of foot in the, the door doing clinical stuff, uh, scribing for lots of physicians and what you learn from them. You, you do get into a story here with Rob. Uh, again, my, my general recommendation for, for stuff like this is always just to remove any sort of doubt, put, put some, some quotes there around the first time mm -hmm. you use it just to okay. let everyone know it's, it's, a, it's a pseudonym, I promise. <laughs> um, and the uh, the path that you went on there. So good job there. All right, so 2014, 48 hours. 
uh, challenging your comfort zone, uh, run by nuns, interesting. And uh, what did you do here? You have uh, uh, an interaction with a second grader um, and what the impact you had uh, on them was. So that was great. And actually um, that experience, even though it wasn't that long, Mm -hmm. I actually, someone asked me in an interview um, what was my most influential experience um, volunteering. And I talked about this story um, and I talked about it not because of what I did to that, like wh- how I influenced the community, yeah. but how the community influenced me. Yeah. And when I was talking about this program, actually, my interviewer said, oh, I know of that place. Like, I have volunteered there, too. Yeah. So the stories help. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Diabetic educator. Okay. So the uh, why it's important, the, the population there uh, and who you impacted, uh, the the kind of messaging there, brainstorming all this stuff, which is great. Again, potentially an opportunity to talk about one specific patient, but uh, you got the point across there. Cultural significance of food and its link to wellness, obviously very important. And then more research and lots of hours there. So you're doing research a, a ton. You, you check all of the boxes for activities uh, and you, you super check to the clinical experience. You have tons and yep. tons of clinical experience, which helps. You did have the one, um, where'd it go? The one hobby on there, which is awesome mm-hmm. to show who you are as a as a person. Did you fill all fifteen spots here? Yes. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So good. Good job with that, showing a little bit of everything for who you are. All right, and then we get to personal statement. All right, and and then what was your what was your goal with the personal statement? I mean, and it was hard for me because I felt like I had to go in. I had so many stories. I had so many things that were like significant to me from all these years of, of taking care of people. And so it's like, you have to narrow it down to like either one interaction or like, you know, the big overarching feeling of why, why medicine. And I think that like, once you get too much stuff that you could think of that falls into that category, you got to be really like critical about which things you pick. Mm. Um, so that was really hard. You know, I started out with like a, a five or six page personal okay. statement because it's just so, you know, it just comes out. <laughs> yeah. So. so looking at your personal statement here, you, you get off uh, right into some storytelling, which is awesome. Fl- flicking worms back into the grass. I, I do that now. I walk around my neighborhood with my kids I do too. <laughs> and I'm like, there's a worm that needs saving. Let's save the worm. Uh, and we'll, we'll get a little stick and flick it back into the grass. Or else the the Colorado sun will just melt it by noon. Exactly. (laughs) Um, So you're you're saving all these animals, painting this picture of uh, you just wanting wanting to save uh, things, people, not not people, things. Uh, And so uh, love for the underdog. You jump right into scribe. So there's there's a little bit of a lack of connection from okay, real love of the underdog, how is that patience? How is that I want to do medicine? And jumping right into scribe. So again, I'm a little, I'm a little like, okay, but I I want a little bit more, a little more connection, a little more reflection there. Um, It's an interesting opening. It's very visual, uh, but it's not reflective much, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. So yeah, it was, uh, it was so hard. It was pages and pages and pages. (laughs) So we had to just ax and ax and ax. It was, it was a challenge. Yeah. Got it. All right. So we, we have that. Uh, and then you go into scribe, you're skidding down the hallway. So nice little visual there, um, towards the journey and you, uh, the doctor arrived, patient burst through double door. So your writing here is very good, very visual, which is great. Uh, patient coming in and uh, the patient's eyes open. He'd come up from the deep ocean for a breath of air. So very, very visual, uh, which is good. And then you um, talk about a, a little bit why this was impactful and uh, this pursuit of medicine. I wanted the knowledge to provide solutions to Ben's suffering in that moment of chaos, right? Very common reason for wanting to go into this, which is great. Uh, and here's your theme, right? The underdog. So that's that's the underdog part here. Uh, themes in general, I'm not a big fan of. 
Uh, but it worked, again, it worked well enough for you to get into medical school, so we can't complain. Focus here on suffering, and so we're going to talk about transition here. So that's why there's not a ton of reflection up here about medicine, because the only reason for this is this, Mm -hmm. is to introduce your theme. Then you get into a watering event, and then you jump into your seed. And so it's at, it's, not out of order, it's in a different order, which is perfectly fine. There's there's no right or wrong. Students are like, you have to go seed, watering, watering. I'm like, first of all, <laughs> seed, watering, watering is made up words that I created. It doesn't have to be any of that. <laughs> and uh, you definitely don't have to have any specific order. It can be watering, seed, watering. It can be watering, watering, seed. It can be whatever the heck you want. It's it's your essay. You write it, write it how you want. Um, but, but obviously here talking about this um, human suffering and then talking about your friend uh, Ava here. Uh, And so you lost her in the middle of the school week and everything that happened uh, that night. And so it was interesting to read this. I remember when I first read this, I was trying to understand this story that you're telling. My assumption is that you weren't there. How did you tell so much story of what happened without you being there? Because she, her, her mother told us in yeah. detail, the part that I think bothered me so much as when I was a kid, cause I was, um, I was young at the time was that I knew that this whole experience had happened mm-hmm. and she had told like the, her public statement to everybody, like at the school was that she died in her sleep, which was not what happened. Um, and that really bothered me as when I was younger and I felt like, you know, by kind of like acting out those experiences that she had and what that really looked like. Like it was almost like how, like how lonely that must be, you know, for people who are having that type of that level of health issues and not being able to talk about it and not being able to, you know, have anybody there in those moments that are really like traumatizing and critical and look different than what like the public wants to hear. And I think that that really like, is part of what really pushed me into medicine is like, they need somebody like people need somebody who wants to be there at those points, Mm -hmm. not just like the clean, you know, neat version of the story after. Yeah. And it's an interesting story to to come away from that. Right. That, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Got it. So good, good story there. Uh, Great seed that, that kind of is driving you omitted reality of patient like Ben. So Ben, I think was this guy, right? The, Mm -hmm. yeah. So Ben was the first guy. So bringing him back up here, this, this in between, right? It's like you're, you're in the in between, whatever that is and everything in between, right? Blood blood transfusion, breaking ribs, sweat running down the backs of staff, doing CPR, all of that in between that, that nobody really wants to talk about and, or think about. So, um, this stance, right? Unafraid to look sickness in the eye, but I crave the truth, even when it comes uh, damp, naked, blind, and covered in vomit. So some pretty, pretty stiff visuals there. That's uh, yeah. that's a risk. It is a risk. It is a risk. And I had, you know, I definitely had people like who edit it for me who like, it's very polarizing. Yeah. It came so easily because I felt it like in my heart, you know? And so like, that was the truth. And mm-hmm. so it's like, do you tell a story that's not the story that got you here or do you tell tell that story you know Hmm. so and i think that the truth of it i think is is important and that's that's the the hard part about this journey uh with telling a story writing your personal statement getting feedback from people that are like yeah maybe you shouldn't and you're like but i want to because that's my drive and that's who i am and that's my truth and Again, at the end of the day, you, you have to tell your truth. And uh, if, if this is the story that you want to go with, obviously, again, it worked for you at the, the school. How many interviews total did you get? Was it just the one school? Three interviews. Three. Okay. Interesting. Got three interviews. So at those three schools, wasn't an issue for them, how you wrote your your stuff. And and again, at the end of the day, the, the goal for, here for Mission Accepted or anywhere else is not be like, you have to do it my way or else uh, you did it your way. It's probably a little bit more extreme than I would typically recommend. But again, it's, it's your truth and it's it's what your passion is. It's what you can talk about. That comes out. And and if you don't tell your truth, then that, that's easy to, to see as well. So mm-hmm. great job. You have here these, uh, these people did not recover neatly and crisp, clean lines, uh, clean stories. Uh, hand in hand with the physicians, right? So um, 
kind of painting this picture of, of you wanting to be the one running towards it as well. And so very interesting story. Uh, nice little takeaway here, um, serving them and uh, not, not omitting their story, which is wonderful. So then we get to uh, a very short school list. Why did you apply to so few schools? I knew my best luck with my stats would be in state. Okay. Um, I'm a resident of Michigan and I wanted to stay close to home. So yeah, that was the goal. So looking at your application had amazing clinical experience. You've been driving towards this path for a long time. You struggled early with some classes, mm-hmm. things going on, but you recovered. You did a post back. We talk about upward trend all the time and you did just enough to appease the medical schools that you wanted to go to. So yes. uh, just applaud you and want everyone to understand, right? You can go out to the medical schools and have conversations with them and say, hey, here's my story. And ideally, before you apply, right? Here's my story. Can you help me? Here's my very specific questions, right? I'm doing a post back. Should I do 15? Should I do 20? Should I do 25 credits? Should I do 4,000 credits? Like whatever that yep. is. And and just get the feedback directly from the horse's mouth, as they say. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any, yeah. any other words of wisdom? To set yourself apart from other students who might say, you know, oh, I know this school is a good fit for me because, you know, and then start talking about stuff that they might be able to see on like the website. Um, My first choice school um, sets out a lot of seminars. They talk about a lot about, uh, about community related issues. Um, And they like, those are like free to the public and they do it on zoom or they do it in person at different locations. Um, and I've been attending those at the school that I'm currently going to since I was a junior in college. Um, so I was a non-trad, so that was years and years ago. <laughs> um, and so those are just because I was interested in them, not because I was like, oh, I want to look good, you know, but um, they were talking about topics that I thought were interesting. And I think um, by doing some of that extra legwork, you can see what the priorities of the school that you are interested in, what they are, not just what they show on their website, but like what their actual areas of, of interest are. Yeah. I got um, uh, research opportunities from going to those. Like I got volunteer opportunities going to those. Like you find a lot of like the very specific items that the school values. Um, and then when, when I had interviews with the school, I could say, I want to do this because, you know, mm-hmm. I, you know, went to this seminar and I know that you're interested or you're interested in helping this population and I'm interested in this population. So Um, my application is a little different because I wanted to make sure that it, I showed that I was interested in underserved, um, populations and interested in underserved medicine. And I think that the, um, Michigan state college of human medicine, which is where I am now is very focused on that. Um, but if I came in as like a general applicant, just as somebody who applied all over the country, I might not have it as fine-tuned to exactly what their interests are Mm -hmm. so um i think if you have a school that you're interested in you should research you know what their what um their priorities are as far as service and academia and then um try and attend as much um that's free and available as you can so that you can say oh i'm not just interested i went to all these things you know i saw these i've talked to this person blah 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 so then like it doesn't sound like you're just, oh, I'm just saying it because I pulled it up on the website yeah. type situation. <laughs> and, and then something else that I I noticed from your application was you did something that I highly recommend students do who can do it specifically for AMCAS. This only works for AMCAS is if you have your PI or physicians that you work with or physicians that you shadow who are alumni of specific institutions, you can have that person, assuming they agree to write you a letter of recommendation, they can write a letter of recommendation for the specific school that you want to go to yes. and a general recommendation for all the other schools. And, and you yes, did, I that. did that. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is awesome. Yes, I did that. Yeah, and I think um, also like, Obviously, I know that it's not, it doesn't work for everybody in the country, but if you have a school that you're really interested in um, and you are working alongside graduates of that school to be able to say specifically, um, like, um, 
when you get your secondary essay and you they say, why do you want to come here over everywhere else? If you say specifically, I worked alongside your graduates and I liked the way they practice more than everybody else. And I could spot a graduate of this school from a mile away, you know, and that's what I want to do. I want to be like these people. Like, how are they going to argue with that? Like compared to somebody who's like, oh, I just looked it up on the website. It seemed cool, you know? So that would be my recommendation. 